Let's get started. Welcome to today's textile talk. We're really excited about this topic and this presentation, and we'd like to welcome you to today's talk. Uh, my name is Astrid Hilger Bennett. I'm the president of Surface Design Association, the sponsor of this particular presentation. Otherwise, we're known as SDA. The potential of paper, fiber artists, paper maker and sculpture form, sculptural form, a conversation with Mary Hark, Jocelyn Chateauvert, and Fafner Adamides. That's the name of today's talk and welcome. I have a much better understanding now of why some actors prefer live theater over television, but aren't we lucky we can do this? For those new to this weekly series of webinars, Textile Talks is a collaboration between six textile nonprofits, the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and SDA. Our talk today is also part of the LA Textile Month in California. Welcome to viewers from LA Textile Month. And for this webinar, your screen and microphone will be automatically set to off. Founded in 1977, SDA is a national membership nonprofit consisting of artists, educators, students, and enthusiasts from around the world. SDA is known for its high caliber quarterly journal, but members also participate in exhibitions, regional groups, grants, and awards. Members often work in a variety of fiber media, mi migrating from one to another depending on ideas they'd like to convey. As an artist myself, I find this particularly exciting. Join us on our website and on social media for a robust portrait of SDA interests and activities. These talks would not exist without the support of our 11 sponsors, shown in the opening and closing slides. Please thank them when you place any orders. We have a new sponsor this week called Empty Spool Seminars and welcome to them. About the format of this presentation, each artist will give a presentation of about 10 minutes. I'll be introducing each artist and after they have finished, we'll open up the presentation to your questions. Putting your questions in the Q&A box located on the perimeter of your screen will allow us to manage questions more easily. Please put them there instead of the chat box. This presentation will be recorded and available for later viewing on the Textile Talks YouTube channel, which has all the presentations so far and is a really great resource. So let's get started. I wanna stop my screen share for a minute. Um, just a second. Just one second, folks. Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, let's get started. I want to please join me in welcoming Jocelyn Chateauvert. Why don't you give us a little wave? Um, Fafner Adamides and Mary Hark. Okay, so why paper? If you in the audience are new to the field of paper, you may be asking the question, well, paper is fiber art. Paper is one of the most fibrous art forms in the world and has a 2000 year history. A quick glance at the history and forms of paper and hand paper making would reveal that almost anything can be made into paper and has been cotton rags, abaca, flax, and on and on. Humankind has been really ingenious. I'm sure our artist photos will demonstrate this characteristic. So at this time, we'll move to three presentations because that's what we really wanna see. Starting with a focus on individual studio practice and ending with comments on socially engaged and sustainable paper making. I'll do a short introduction of each presenter right before they share their screens with you. 
We'll start with Jocelyn Chateauvert. So um, Jocelyn, um, in just a minute, you can be the screen share person and the rest of us will uh, go uh, away. Go away, <laughs> yes. Jocelyn is an independent artist who works in three-dimensional form, exploring installation and personal adornment, as well as producing corporate commissions, all with the paper she makes by hand. Jocelyn lived for many years in Charleston, South Carolina, and has recently returned to her native Iowa. So we look forward to seeing your images, Jocelyn. Once I figure it out. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Sorry, folks. I that's okay. Just a screen share. Yeah. Hmm. Where's my screen share? The button's at the lower left. Um, no, I, yeah, I've got, I've got it. Okay. Jocelyn has, is sitting by this wonderful window with really great plants next to her, and I'm reminded of her forms. There we go. So, Found it, double click. <laughs> so um, thank you for having me, Astrid, SDA, fabulous organization, encouraging everyone to join. Um, all the other sponsors, SAQA, et cetera. Um, brief background, I have a Master of Fine Arts in Metalworking and Jewelry, um, but studied simultaneously at the University of Iowa, paper making, and it has been my passion now for over 30 years. Everything for me starts with the Hollander beater. This is where we decide how short the fibers are. This is how we decide what fiber to use. So this is my Hollander beater. It's about a one pound beater uh, and it makes a lot of noise and I love it for it. I'm going to give you a quick tutorial of how you make paper in case people do not know. The first thing is after it's been beaten, we put it in a vat and we agitate the fibers with our hands. Everything is done by hand, keeping it agitated so that when the mold dips through, the fibers are suspended evenly throughout the vat. We put, we, um, we pull that fiber towards us and it slides across the surface of the mold. The edge is called the decal. We agitate momentarily and then we let the mold rest. We then take the decal off. This gives reference to the decal edge that you find on handmade papers. Then we cooch. turning that mold upside down onto a felt. We layer the felts, one sheet of paper, one piece of felt to make a post, a stack. So here I am cooching the paper. It rolls off the surface of the mold. Give it a final love. And there's the sheet of paper. We then put it into a press behind the paper itself in the back on the left and squeeze out the excess water. We're then able to peel the sheet off the, uh, off the felt surface and hold it up. It's now an integral and strong piece of paper. My first work was given the MFA in jewelry, jewelry itself. Um, I worked with the paper primarily flat at the time. I integrated it with sterling silver. Uh, I used cold connections of metal to combine paper and metal together. And these are uh, a few examples of the pieces that I made. On the left is Eve uh, and then earrings of both a shield on the top and cylinders, simple names. 
This is a bracelet with a silver cuff with paper attached and rings that bobble back and forth like, I don't know, like a bobble. Um, you can see that the paper has been curled around onto itself and has uh, a lot of uh, internal strength to maintain that shape, and they do. This started me really thinking about how to integrate structure into the works that I wanted to make and to make them uh, self-supporting without the use of any internal bamboo or traditional matrices. The pleat became the first source of integrating a structure uh, because it gave a vertical or a hot horizontal to um, the structure of the paper. It then became self-supporting. These are some lamps. Paper loves light. Uh, again, you see the pleating. Then you start pleating one way. Well, then you start thinking, well, why can't I pleat the other way as well? So these are um, more recent pieces that came together in a large sheet using my Singer sewing machine. So now I've gone from making wet sheets, integrating a structure, creating a, a, a pattern with, with folding. And now I sew, sew long panels together to make large scale sheets. I then can form these into this uh, particular use of huge pendant drum lamps up to um, five and a half feet in diameter. Another use for my sewing machine is to quilt. To, um, so I've taken sheets of paper, I've actually ink dyed the paper, and I've started to sew them into a panel-like form. Or given that I make a lot of paper, I've made a larger size quilt. This is called flyover. And it references the fields um, that one sees when one is, was once in an airplane. Layering layers, these, uh, this is referencing how another technique of creating mass um, with individual sheets of paper. All of the paper I make and use, I dry. I, I air dry, I never restrain it. So that makes it what we call cockling and gives it these nice organic shapes. By cutting the paper when the paper is wet, it softens the edges of the paper. By folding when the paper is wet, you don't get the same sense of a crease. Instead, if it's, it's a more softer fold, a more organic looking fold, more integral to the sheet than working with things when they are dry. Here's an example of a lamp. All the petals have been individually cut and then pressed together all when it's wet and then left to dry and then I peel those petals apart. This is another example of the layering technique. This has uh, more of a well, it's, of course, it's on a metal structure as the drum pendant, but um, the petals are attached to a central core and then wrapped around the drum. One of the things I'm particularly keen about uh, in the last four or five years is hand rolling uh, sheets of paper into sculptural forms. Uh, one of the techniques I use are making individual sheets, cutting them, and then attaching them and rolling the interiors. So on the left, you'll see a huge stack of papers that have been cut, rolled in the center core, attached together and, and, and stacked. 
of which I then apply to a cylinder to drape over, to, to tighten up the, the rolling of the internal spaces, and then it dries over this center tubing. I've also then gone in and hand rolled every uh, gap between each of the rolls to give it more structure. So, you know, you think of um, rolling just compresses that fiber into more a structural core. This gives a lot of opportunities. Here's a palette of many of these lengths of paper that I make, all integrating color. We do that um, before we make the sheet of paper. And then you have this ability to open these forms, compress these forms, spread these forms out. And it really seems quite extensive. You can turn it into something wearable. I go back to wearables um, throughout my career. You can introduce light. And you can just look at the structural forms within a sculptural piece. Another thing I do is um, I always consider the process of paper making and what can you do along the way. If we're always introducing uh, fiber into the beater, then you have a pulp. After that, you would traditionally make sheets. You would color first if you were going to introduce color. So I always am trying to think, well, what could I do in between? What hasn't been done? Um, what could I experiment with? So this is actually sculpting with the pulp itself on a flat surface. It will then air dry. It will take many, many days to dry, maybe seven days, maybe a week, maybe 10 days because it's so dense. And it starts curling and cockling into these organic forms um, of which on the right I have then painted. The one on the left, of course, is the, is the piece uh, in the drying process. Uh, a few years ago, I went ahead and built a vacuum table. This expedited the pulped sculpting um, by sucking the air, or the, excuse me, the water from the back of the piece. So if you don't mind, it's a little noisy, but we'll play and you'll see the visual effect of how the vacuum pump works. Now I'm able to peel that piece off of the surface to let it dry. Again, on the vacuum table, working with colorful forms, letting it air dry, letting it take on natural shapes. The other thing you can do with a vacuum table is you can draw. So using a finer grade of pulp, in this case it was colored, you can create your own imagery on the surface of the pellon, that's the base of uh, under uh, above the vacuum table. And in this instance, I took the pellon and I dried it on a clothesline and the paper adhered so beautifully to the pellon itself that I was able to peel the paper off as demonstrated on the right. And I had to, I introduced no additional forming. It, it took on the shape itself. I did this a lot to make these kelp totems. These are about 10 feet tall. I've been playing with paper, as I said, over 30 years, and there are so many techniques I like to use that I'm now kind of drawn to this idea of a three-dimensional drawing of sorts. 
taking the different forms that I make, the different techniques, the different, I don't know, feelings perhaps, um, and putting them into a situation where they can work off each other. This is one that's currently in my studio. I've recently moved, I have a new studio. So I'm just kind of getting up to speed, but this is kind of the direction I'm taking. I've, I enjoy manipulating paper when it's wet, when it's dry, when it's in pulp. Um, color is, is relatively new, uh, but I find that most of it, of course, is reflective of nature, whether I'm in it, to draw from there or just experience it um, through the paper itself. This is my new studio in an old school, two blocks from my house. So we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, SDA. Thank you, Sequa and sponsors. Thank you, Jocelyn. That was really amazing. Um, we can stop screen sharing. And that was really amazing. Thank you so much. I, I did have one question for you that might help us move to the next sections. Yes, uh, people did want to know what was the fiber you were using in the original vats? Uh, oh, Abaca. Yeah, okay. Banana leaf. Yeah. Vanilla hemp. It's Great. been used for about 500 years and it's, it's it's the fiber that I use most often. Yes. Okay, we'll get into more questions later. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Fafner, we are looking forward to your presentation now. Fafner uses weaving, felting, and paper making to make sculptural forms and conceptual work as meditations on generational emotional trauma. Fafner also teaches at Indiana University. Their home base is in Massachusetts. And Fafner, why don't you go and take it away? And we'll hide our screens, Jocelyn and I. Thank you so much, Astrid. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, the work that I started um, with paper and sort of a transition that um, I took in my, my studio um, a couple years ago. So to begin with, um, I began working with paper more intensely um, in my studio in about 2015. Um, previously, I'd been working more in uh, felt making um, and sculptural forms generally. But when I began, um, I was working mainly with mulberry paper and working in a, a sort of refined uh, paper mache style. So I was using very fine uh, sheets of already pigmented uh, mulberry paper, um, almost tissue paper, and many, many layers on forms, um, a lot of inflatable forms um, and other sort of homemade forms. And I was really exploring the ideas around um, sort of husks, uh, I was looking at ideas of um, hollow forms, forms that were shells, and I was really kind of trying to push what my ideas about paper were. So I was trying to challenge the paper, um, how big could it be? Um, how heavy could it be before it collapsed? Um, how could I hold a form without any kind of armature inside? And a lot of this kind of material exploration was about uh, trying to uh, kind of connect the materials to uh, the concepts that I was working with. And at that time in 2015, I had been starting research on uh, counter monuments um, in Germany, specifically in Berlin. Um, and the uh, thing that I was really learning about counter monuments was the, uh, the really complicated issue of uh, memory about uh, making memorials for traumatic events, um, holding space for people who are no longer there, um, and also holding space for um, difficult conversations. 
So some of these really large scale works, like in this, this piece here, um, the form on the right is nine and a half feet tall. The one on the left is five and a half feet tall. Um, I was playing with uh, what kind of material, what kind of forms could be used as a monument. Uh, could ephemeral material be used as a monument? Uh, can we use uh, monumental forms that break down over time that need maintenance? Um, all of these ideas sort of harken back to the original conceptual drive of thinking about inherited trauma. So working within these husk forms, thinking about a replica of an object uh, that came before it or a memory of an object that came before it sort of goes back to that idea of inheriting um, trauma or uh, traits from someone in a previous generation um, within your family. Um, and this uh, working with this kind of material um, kind of goes back also to uh, um, the idea of repetitious processes and having those also replicate this idea of inherited trauma. So felt making was very much uh, that kind of process for me too. Um, physically repetitive processes, ones that were uh, physically engaging and at times uh, really physically exhausting as well. Um, I think you could probably imagine that doing many, many layers of paper mache around a nine and a half foot orb um, may be a little physically challenging. Um, and as a maker, I've always been very focused on my physical connection to the piece. Um, I'm very stubborn in wanting to do this work on my own in my studio and not having um, studio assistants or other people working on that part as well. And I, I, I think that as, as I work on those large scale pieces and the other pieces that I work on now as well, um, really working through that repetition and even the physical um, exhaustion of it is part of my own meditation on some of these ideas. Uh, replicating objects um, also came at a smaller scale as well. Um, this form of the pendulum or plumb bob has been um, an image or an object that I refer back to really frequently. Um, it definitely symbolizes the, um, the need for intuition, um, the need for uh, finding place, wayfinding. Um, and uh, looking at this piece, um, this is again mulberry paper um, around forms. Um, and I should note, I'm sure somebody's going to ask me, um, I use methyl cellulose as the binder. So the thin sheets of mulberry paper plus methyl cellulose, which is uh, typically a, a book binding glue. Um, it's archival and it dries really matte rather than glossy. And I really uh, always gravitate towards those matte, non-reflective surfaces in these paper forms. Um, this is particularly nice uh, because the rust from the used, um, the old plumb bobs transfers to the paper and becomes another um, sort of recording or remnant of the history of these tools. So after working uh, in these husk forms, this paper mache uh, kind of process, I continued to think more about why paper was um, interesting to me in my process. Like I said, the material exploration and experimentation is really important in my studio. Um, and I had been working with felt making for so long and the uh, transformational quality of felt making uh, has always been a really incredible process for me, um, both physically, um, seeing it happen. Um, if there's any felt makers in the audience, you'll know what I mean. Um, that transformation from the chaotic uh, pile of wool to the tight uh, sort of singular piece after the wet felting process is over. Um, and I wanted to see how that kind of uh, transformational aspect could come into play with paper as well. Um, so this is a piece that I made in 2016 that combines wool and paper. So this is one of the uh, sort of transitional points in the work I had been doing. And you can see in this piece that the, the white wool 
had uh, black paper sandwiched in between layers. And when the wool shrunk, it took the paper with it. So uh, when I sliced the piece and sort of showed the interior um, of those, um, those layers, you could see how the black paper has become uh, shrunken. It really, uh, to me, it looks a lot like handwriting um, and specifically indecipherable handwriting. Um, this is also a theme that comes up a lot for me in my work is this um, sort of obscured storytelling or obscured narrative. I think this is why I work with abstract forms um, really often is uh, because the idea of telling the story of trauma in a linear or narrative form is um, it's impossible. It's uh, not something that can be made sense of in that way. Um, so this, this concept of the, uh, the story that's out of your reach or an explanation that's out of your reach comes up again and again. Um, I do also want to note before I go on um, that uh, wool and paper are two materials that I call chaos structures. And this is also another important aspect of my um, sort of gravitational pull towards these materials. Um, so the idea of a chaos structure is that it is a material like wool and paper pulp um, that are, um, they begin with no order. Um, it's a chaotic mess, um, but through its process or through the process of the artist, the maker um, working with it, it becomes something else. It becomes a new landscape, a new surface. Um, and that kind of, uh, I know I keep using the word uh, transformational again and again, but uh, I think in line with the conceptual um, sort of urge behind this work, finding a new way of being is really important. And of course, this is uh, looking at uh, materials in opposition to the grid, which would be more like weaving. Um, and this piece, uh, which is also um, kind of the beginning of a, a new way of working for me, uh, began with a frame loom and what I call a chaos weaving on a small frame loom. Uh, with cotton string and then dipping that into paper pulp. So this was the beginning of my uh, studio practice using kind of going away from the preformed paper sheets um, just to the paper pulp itself. So uh, using that amazing chaotic slurry of pulp here is where I began uh, really using Abaca paper pulp almost exclusively um, and I pigment this um, in the vat when I'm working. Um, so uh, this is the beginning of really exploring how the pulp transforms um, orderly um, materials like a weaving, like netting. Um, I began working with much more open permeable forms at this point. Um, and really, I'm still thinking a lot about the way that paper can cover an armature or cover an object of some kind and change maybe a shiny or um, metal material into something more fibrous and matte, like in this piece, um, covering a wire armature with the pulp. I appreciate that uh, really tactile fibrous surface, but again, going back to that, uh, that transformation of surface, the, the hiding or concealing of the form underneath, um, and this kind of also brings me to um, another, another concept that um, kind of comes back again and again in my work. And it's the idea of, um, or the sort of juxtaposition, um, the tension between the ideas of covering um, versus concealing, um, or maybe more articulately, um, uh, preventing growth versus, um, protection of a form. Uh, let me go even, even further with that, the idea of impeding, the idea of uh, constricting versus preserving. So um, not to belabor the point, but I keep going back to those ideas. And I think that uh, this is where in intuition comes into play yet again, um, finding intuition versus um, being stuck within a uh, 
predetermined uh, mode or path, hearkening back to the inherited trauma idea, um, and kind of subverting the rigidity of the grid, um, the rigidity of what is already offered, um, and finding, finding something new, finding something different. Um, this is one of the latest pieces um, that I've been working on. This is part of a series. Um, and this is a, a netting that has been dipped multiple times in Abaca paper pulp and uh, tied with this um, kind of covered rope um, apparatus. So um, I'm, this is a good close up so that you can really see how the grid is disrupted um, in this piece. Um, I want to note for the folks out there who may not be working in or who don't have access to a traditional paper making studio, um, though I began a lot of this work um, from the a generous uh, residency at Wyndham Studio Workshop. Um, I, after that um, initial time of working in a paper making studio, I do this in my garage, I do this in my backyard. Um, in my studio, in my house, um, basically wherever, wherever I can line up some tubs or buckets and maybe a drop cloth. Um, I have had to work a little bit smaller scale um, because of the spaces that I work in. Um, but I, I do want to uh, just put a little note of encouragement to anybody who wants to work in this kind of uh, very wet and often very messy kind of process um, and materials that it is definitely possible um, in all sorts of different kinds of spaces. Um, and maybe we can talk about that more later. Um, so thank you everybody for listening. I look forward to questions um, and thanks to all of the sponsors and everyone who put together uh, this textile talk. Thank you, Fafner. What a wonderful, wonderful set of images and such a different kind of work. Just really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on since our time is moving along to Mary Hark. Um, Mary maintains an active paper making workshop, Hark Handmade Paper, creates personal pieces using indigo and other natural dyes and stitching and is a passionate longtime advocate for sustainable paper making projects in Ghana. Mary uh, Hart teaches at the University of Wisconsin. And we'll get started with you. Hi, I'm going to go right into my screen share. And um, there we go. OK. I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of my practice, um, which is uh, which has is has many facets. I just want to first of all, of course, thank Astrid and SDA. But gosh, I'm in such incredible company. I think Jocelyn and Fafner are pushing boundaries in our field, which are exciting and wonderful and beautiful and important. And I thank you um, for sharing your la the the last two presentations were really lovely. Um, I, um, like Jocelyn, I came uh, to paper making um, through another door. Jocelyn came through um, jewelry and I came through textiles. And I came to there um, at the time when Tim Barrett at the University of Iowa um, started the Iowa Center for the Book. And I was in the first class of paper makers. And that was just a pretty wonderful um, and solid foundation on which to build my career. I'm gonna just hit these slides um, really quickly. And sometimes I'll be talking about what you see on the slide and sometimes I might not, but to give you a little bit of a window into my life as a paper maker um, and an academic. Um, my shop is in St. Paul, Minnesota and it was the two car garage on a home that I have had for quite a while. And very recently in the last few years, I transformed that shop in that garage into a shop. It's in the heart of the Frogtown neighborhood, which is a neighborhood with lots of new immigrants. And, um, and I really think of myself as the neighborhood paper maker and I have lots of neighborhood investment in, in the work that goes on in the shop. And I, I'm gonna share a project later on that rose right up out of this neighborhood. 
um, happily, Jocelyn shared the process of hand paper making with you so beautifully, so you can get a sense. But the primary tool that I use is the Hollander beater. Um, and I, I make um, sheets that are used in, uh, for fine press, usually on commission. Uh, someone will come that knows my aesthetic and say, I'm doing this book of, uh, say, regional poetry. And we're interested in having you develop a sheet of paper that would be appropriate for a cover or for end sheets. And then I develop a sheet of paper and they choose it or, and I go into production. Um, maybe between 200 and 700 sheets is typical. Um, these are uh, some examples of book projects that I've been involved in. Um, with a, a book designer, book maker um, listed there, uh, Jan, the uh, calligrapher. Um, uh, and collaborative, collaboration is really always, a, um, very often, a big part of book, book binding. In this case, um, there was a poet, Stuart Kostenbaum, a printer, Susan Webster, and I was the book designer and the paper maker. And we shared our work, sending it back and forth through the mail. Um, and um, ended up with a project that we all felt quite um, invested in. So um, I also have work that is really inspired um, by my, I think fundamentally by my domestic life, by my personal life. Um, as I mentioned, I come to papermaking through the door of the textile studio, which I think is a really different orientation than coming for, so often people come to paper through printmaking where the paper is deeply appreciated as a substrat for um, holding the idea or the image. Um, but I uh, came to paper, learned my um, trade as a paper maker uh, uh, at the same time that I was really deeply invested in um, textile processes. And the paper pulp, the papers that I, I make became an extension of uh, my palette. So from, if you think of one end of that table, having piles of really soft absorbent cotton velveteen and the other end of that table holding wood. Um, every uh, surface and absorbency uh, ability in the middle there become um, what I have to, to draw from when I build these things, which I think of as constructed paintings. At a certain point in my um, career, I was um, given a chance to uh, spend a year in Ghana on a Fulbright Fellowship. I went to study textiles in a hot spot in the world for textiles and um, made friends with all kinds of traditional makers as well as um, uh, contemporary artists. And at a certain point, I went to the university near where I, I was staying and um, asked if I could um, participate in some way and ended up running a six week paper making workshop for third year printmakers. And we um, used what the materials that were on hand, which is fundamentally, it's a, it's a rainforest, so it was like a botanical garden. Um, and we worked and worked to find um, the pulp that, we, the, that would have the integrity that could be used by these students um, in their art projects. At a certain point, I um, pulled out a box of Asian fiber, the mulberry that's been mentioned um, by, by Fafner, um, that I had ordered, you know, came from Asia to Minneapolis and then uh, shipped to Ghana. And we started adding that Asian fiber to the plantain and cashew and maize, the things that were available on the campus. And it exponentially improved the quality of that paper. Um, and so I, and the, and the students were over the moon by the process. Um, I went to the Forestry Commission in Ghana and asked if we had a plant that was like the pulp mulberry. Um, and they surprised me by um, sharing that in fact, uh, these plants had been brought over in 1969, a, a small number of them, and they were now growing out of control as a uh, invasive non-indigenous plant. Um, and following that Fulbright year, I joined the faculty in Madison, a big research university, and have been able to get funding to uh, develop a community project there using this um, insidious non-indigenous plant um, that has actually produced some of the, the plant that came from China, where it had produced some of the most beautiful papers in the history of the world. Um, and uh, work in community there to not only improve, to try to make a high quality sheet that would be appropriate for artists and uh, bookbinders and sculptors and, and, but also to think about um, 
ways that it might be integrated into the into the local marketplace um, as a way of um, imp uh, developing a, a livelihoods for people. So we're in the process of um, creating a for-profit, um, you know, bricks and mortar sort of warehouse where we are making sheets of paper that can um, be used for uh, for things that are practical and useful in that environment. These are uh, high-end product we're making, uh, folding screens. We're hoping this might be a cash cow. There is money in Ghana, it's just not well distributed. Um, and uh, thinking about big public spaces, hotel uh, lobbies and uh, high-end residences, um, hoping to um, uh, develop a cash flow that can help um, hire people and keep um, the production going. This, these are uh, folding screens that have been, um, uh, the pattern, the design on them has been developed by uh, riffing off of the traditional textiles uh, in the area. Uh, backed with handmade paper, backed with uh, pulp mulberry that is sometimes mixed with um, textile waste. These are some of the other products that are coming from that project. Um, of course, uh, cloth and beautifully colored cloth is ubiquitous in West Africa and in Ghana. And so we're and there are many, many seamstresses and we're able to collect the scraps. Um, we were able to bring a Hollander beater into our project and turn that into pulp. And here is my one of my studio assistants from Ghana, Henry Obang, um, and uh, with a production one summer of, of sheets uh, and examples of some of the um, products that um, we've been able to make. We're hoping to break into the paper bag uh, industry. Um, paper bags, um, like like every place on the globe, we're trying to get rid of that polyurethane bag, and paper bags are um, starting to enter the uh, marketplace. And this paper is strong. Um, it's also a place where cloth is really well appreciated and understood and um, uh, spinning the pulp mulberry and then uh, weaving it and um, integrating it into other kind of textile structures is something people get very excited about. And then producing, um, you know, functional items that could be for the tourist market or for uh, local consumption. These are uh, fans, it's hot there. People carry fans and use fans all the time and, um, and a beautiful model with one of our fans. So um, closer to home in my, st in my uh, neighborhood in St. Paul, as I mentioned, it's a emerging neighborhood with lots of, um, lots of uh, new immigrants and low income people. Um, my immediate neighbor, say two Jones, um, orchestrated a wonderful project in which 2,000 friends and neighbors sat down at a half mile table to um, share a meal, um, uh, highlighting community, but also shining a light on the issue of food security. And he um, asked me to contribute to the effort, first asking if I would produce paper plates, but I said, no, I wouldn't produce paper plates. <laughs> but how about placemats? And so we um, were able to hire a team of five paper makers for the summer and train them to be very excellent paper makers and teachers. Oops, I'm going in the wrong direction, sorry. Um, and uh, we set up uh, both in, in my driveway, uh, making sheets from bio waste in the neighborhood. So from materials collected from the yards and alleys of the immediate neighborhood. And we also took that show on the road to all different corners of this neighborhood where we used a portable Hollander beater and all portable equipment and where we'd set up and people walking um, to the bus or back from work or on their way to school could stop and make a sheet and have a conversation about paper. Um, it was a fabulously um, uh, wonderful experience for me to share something that I love and um, it was extremely well received. And at the end of that um, effort that summer, we had produced 2,400 sheets of paper, which my friends is no joke. Um, and uh, sitting down at that table um, was something that I'll never forget. The food was um, choreogra the choreographed by dancers every two blocks it was delivered. A poet um, had written a poem that we would use as grace at every table. And I was so worried that all those sheets might go in the trash at the end and my team was ready to run and collect the sheets so we might make them into an artist book commemorating the project. But instead, um, 2,000 people walked away carrying a sheet of paper home with them, which was a, 
a pretty wonderful thing for us to see. Um, another project that I am, uh, wanted to shine a light on, particularly to all these fiber artists, uh, was done in collaboration with um, Taproot Farms and um, uh, Patricia Bishop at Taproot Farms and Andrea Micklebust at uh, Mountain, uh, Mountain Heart Vermont uh, Studios, which formerly was Black Cat Farmstead in Western Wisconsin. And we got some money from the state of Wisconsin to explore the idea of re-installing, uh, in uh, re-instituting um, flax production in Western Wisconsin as part of an organic rota rotation. So flax um, is a strong fiber. It's a fiber I use a lot in my studio practice. Um, I love I love linen. Um, this is Andrea and I in the middle of our blooming fields. Um, we were able to I I I was on as a paper maker to um, produce uh, to see how this uh, material would uh, function as a as a potential product for an organic farmer. Um, Andrea is a weaver and a spinner and a shepherd, and she was super interested in the thread. And we, we produced the flax. It was uh, redded in the fields. We packed it in the back of a small truck and drove it to Nova Scotia, where uh, Patricia Bishop at Taproot Farms, and I recommend anyone interested in this to look her up, Taproot uh, Farms in uh, Nova Scotia. She has, a dis she with a group of engineers, has um, developed the only set of affordable um, uh, flax uh, processing machines. As many of you know, flax is very labor intensive and prohibitively so for most of us. And um, she had the idea that a, a place could, uh, this could be a collaboration, these machines could fit on the back of a flatbed truck and be shared by farmers or it could be a, 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 a shared uh, production space, not unlike uh, the way wool uh, producers share um, equipment. So this is just a few shots of that and the, some of the product um, beyond the paper and uh, paper uh, uh, workshop that we ran on the farm in Nova Scotia. And um, always my, my work, my work as an academic at UW-Madison is in um, four hours to the east and I'm back and forth between St. Paul and Madison frequently. And um, I, my work as a studio artist producing these constructed paintings I'm sure is deeply informed by that beautiful drive, usually after four o'clock and mostly in winter, where the light is changing and the fields and the organization of the land is really particular to this place. Um, I, I, uh, I love, and I think more and more of these pieces are as much as anything about the paper itself, which I am more in love with than I've ever been. It, uh, it's, a, it's a love affair that has deepened. I'm going to finish up here with some quick images of paper that I produced during the pandemic shutdown. It's about the only thing I really felt I could do and it did sustain me and I've made hundreds of sheets. My shelves are full and I'm going to stop right there. Um, I'm going to, well, a few more shots here of a recent project just before, um, just before the shutdown. This is a uh, a project done with in collaboration with my neighbors for our local library. And now I really am done. Um, last shots of recent shots in my studio. So um, thank you so much. Okay. And I'm wearing a nod to um, my nod to uh, Justice Ginsburg, who I'm sure many of us miss. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I almost don't know where to start because this was really a wonderful set of three presentations jam-packed with lots of things to think about. Thank you so very much. We don't have a lot of time, but we have a number of questions, uh, a lot of great comments about it, um, about just the accomplishment, the level of accomplishment and so forth. Um, we wondered, a few people wondered what your largest piece is, Fafner, how you do make very large pieces. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the largest piece that I've made um, was uh, one of the first images I showed. So there was a nine and a half foot um, orb that was in that uh, first installation piece. So that's the biggest that I've done um, with that sort of paper mache technique I was talking about with the mulberry paper. Okay. And we have a couple questions that 
uh, might seem, um, well, anyway, they have to do with how do you keep dust off of your pieces, Jocelyn, <laughs> when you install them as um, lighting, for instance? Um, they're, they're, they're still made. It's called a drafting brush. So it's a matter of brushing. Um, though I've never had to go into any kind of institution and actually dust for them. So it, it doesn't really show dust in the way one would think. So, so there. Keeps the oh. conservators busy. I th you can blow it away. You just yeah. you blow it I away. Mean, you, you could use the, um, the drapery brush on a you know, vacuum cleaner, but you know, it's very strong. I mean, this stuff is so strong. Uh, some people asked about what you use to add color. In my day, generally, it was pigments that were added to the, the mix. Is that true for all three of you? Yes. You know, uh, I think um, very often I use the, um, I use textiles and the, in Ghana we're using textile waste and sometimes I'm going to buy linen. There's a, I have access to a linen warehouse near where I live and I use the tenacious industrial color of a uh, industrially produced fabric mainly for for a color i also use a dot a natural dyes indigo walnut cochineal yeah. things things other things for, for i'm me, curious I, about that beautiful black though fafner how do you get that beautiful black yeah i use i use an acrylic based pigment it's just yeah. gorge, it's just gorgeous yeah, it definitely takes a lot um, to get a nice a nice black, but the Abaca pulp is is wonderful to work with. So, yeah. And and uh, others had wondered if you finish the paper with anything, if you're doing a more sculptural form or so forth. No, I don't. Not for my pieces. Nor do I. Uh, sometimes um, on the on my uh, production paper making because I'm using uh, indigo or even the walnut, it can rub off. I use a heavy gelatin size. Um, that way, if somebody uses my paper to make a really expensive book, it's not gonna rub off blue on the really expensive book that's on the shelf right next to it. <laughs> and I, I know that I used to be a gallery manager and we used to carry Jocelyn's work at the gallery and she supplied a little eraser and that's how you clean the, the jewelry. <laughs> And that's true. And a lot of paper, there's so much variety in the thickness and in the strength and so many fibers are very, very strong. So um, yeah, it's really incredible just through the drying process, really how hard and uh, durable the paper can become. And, and the longer that the fiber is beaten, of course, it shrinks. Mm -hmm. So that makes it denser. You also have to remember that there is no grain in paper. So Fafner was talking about chaos in the uh, physical structure of the materials. Uh, she was referencing both felt and paper. So, so it's not, it, it, it means that it's uh, structurally chaotic throughout and doesn't have weak points. I, I also wanted to comment on um, Fafner's work in that being made in paper, it's both fragile and strong. It yes. is that duality coexists. And it, it, I, I'm guessing that that's a purposeful cho material choice based on her um, conceptual concerns. And it, it, I, I'm very attracted to that. I think it's really poetically powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the pieces I've made, um, they really change over time, especially the open husk kind of pieces, depending on humidity. If people touch the pieces, they become softer and lose their form. Um, they curl, you know, they move with air movement within a gallery. Um, so that kind of uh, constant changing um, is really appealing to me as well. I would like to say we have some interesting questions, but we're not going to have time to answer them all. We might be able to do some kind of blog post or something that would answer the questions a little more from this presentation. Um, I can look into that. <clears throat> um, 
I know a number of you are working from home right now, and um, we did address that a little bit as far as what Mary said about working with her students at home and, and Fafner working in person. So I just feel like I want to emphasize too that we want to encourage people to not think that fancy equipment is the uh, basis of you know, making something like this. It's really about one's imagination, which you see in these three presentations. Yeah. Yeah, working with what you have, you know? We've all gotta be scrappy artists at one point or another, right? So we gotta, we gotta keep going. We're always working within boundaries somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having every opportunity is also, um, can stop you dead. Yeah. Well, I just, can't thank you enough for coming here. I think we could spend several hours talking, but <laughs> um, I, I do want to um, uh, say that we do have websites posted in the chat room and all of them are online. Um, we will be, this recording will be present on the Textile Talks YouTube channel for you, for your friends, for your students, it's publicly available for others to watch. Um, a heartfelt thank you to our sponsors and to SACWA for their role in hosting this event. Um, uh, our next Wednesday textile talk will be We Are the Story, presented by Quilt Alliance. And SDA's next textile talk on November 18th will focus on the Canadian Year of Craft featuring Canadian textile artists. Also, please check out the SDA website for more information on our organization. Um, thanks to all of you for tuning in, including friends at LA Textile Month and those associated with hand paper making. Best wishes to all of you. May you continue to feel restored by creativity during this time of challenge and social isolation. See you next Wednesday for another textile talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye-bye.